Hello, my front end friends. Most people see container queries as a step above media queries because they can look at the size of the parent rather than the viewport, which means that we can make more meaningful breakpoints for our components, right? And the, the most classic example is some cards. This one here is from Unikravitz, where just like, you know, it's all the same styling for them, but depending on the space they have, uh, they'll change. Here's another one from Miriam Susan, same type of idea, uh, same styling for both of them but depending on the size they have, the styles can be different. And one last one here by Stephanie Eccles, uh, that's a little bit more whimsical, I guess. Uh, but you can see the same type of thing, depending on the space available, the layouts of them change and move around a little bit. And while the, the card is the classic example, and we're sort of gonna play with that too, but there's some superpowers that go under the radar with container queries that I think they need to be talked about more. Uh, because like, here's an example that we're gonna be looking at a little bit later where we can actually make a component aware of how many columns there are, uh, right? So like when the columns change, the layout of that can change, but it's really based on like, are there one column, two columns, three columns, and not specifically on the width of the element, sort of. We'll see what I mean by that when we get around to that one. With container queries, we can build these smarter design patterns that are based on a lot more than just some magic number of a width. Uh, and that's exactly what I wanna be looking at in this video. And I'm gonna start with sort of the basics of container queries. It'll be a very short introduction because I've done more in-depth content on them in the past, just to get everyone on the same page. If you wanna skip ahead, I've timestamped everything down below as well. So we're gonna start by jumping into this example right here where I have a media query set up where I'm just changing the font size of my H1 and I'll move myself down again since the H1 is at the top. Uh, so yeah, when this is smaller, we have a smaller heading and when it's bigger, the heading increases in size. Nothing too complicated there, very familiar pattern. Uh, but I might want to base it on the width of my main area instead. So here you can see I have my main. So to be able to do that, the first thing we have to do is make sure that our main is actually a container. So we can do that with just with a container type here and say inline size. Now you could actually do this as a size, which means it's looking at the height and the width. You probably don't want to do that. There's some side effects that come with that. Inline size is what you're going to want 99% of the time. This just means we're looking at the inline axis. So unless you change your writing mode to a vertical one, we're talking about left to right or just the width of our element. Uh, so we can set that up and then my media here, I can actually change over to be a con at container. So this is a container query now instead. Uh, and the advantage with this is you'll notice that it's never reaching that larger size. And that's because I have my main set to be in a narrow space. It never gets wide enough for me to want that font size to actually increase. And that's really cool. Now, I might have other areas where I take that off, right? And we actually do allow that area to get a bit wider. So when it does get wider than that, it can actually increase because now my main has more area. That means my H1 has more area and the font size of it can increase. That's really cool. Very quick rundown of the difference between a media query and a container query. Again, if you'd like a lot more in depth, I have a whole video that goes in depth on everything we're looking at here. So I'll link to that. I'll put a card and a link down in the description. Uh, but one of the things that's really important with container queries is units are actually important with them. They matter. They, they do something. Uh, so here, let's actually, we'll switch this over just to a media for now. And I'm going to do 40 rem. Uh, here, it could be M. It could be anything that's sort of like a font size related thing. It's at about 640 pixels. It makes that switch over uh, right there. Now, what you might think is because this is set to rem, if I went on my font size of my HTML and I change this, that it would change when that's happening, right? We've boosted up the font size. Obviously the font size of the text did get bigger, uh, but because my rem now should be looking at this, you would think that that would have changed where this breakpoint is happening, but it hasn't. Uh, if I go here, it's still that exact same point at about 640 pixels where that's happening. And that people don't realize this, but if you do M or rem within a media query, it's not looking at the size of our HTML. It's actually looking at the browser's font size. So before we get to the HTML element. And so that's one of the reasons I used to use M in my media queries is because it was actually the only one that was consistent if you zoomed in or out between all the major browsers. Now all three major browsers work the exact same way. So you can just use pixels if you want. Um, but yeah, if you use M, rem or pixels, it doesn't matter what's happening here. This is always going to be a base 16 unless the users change their default font size. And then it's going to go based on that because this is coming from the browser level. Let's bring this back down to 16 and let's bring this right here, uh, back to, or no, we can leave that there, but we're going to come here. We're going to say, this is our container now. 
and you got to spell it right for this to work. And now it's actually at a bigger size than it was before because I'm in M. Let's try rem. Uh, so now it should be at around that same point. It's a little bit different though because it's looking at the size of my main again. And I've defined my container a little differently here. Uh, this is the container's name and then the inline size. So this is a shorthand for container name and container type. Um, and I also have one on my body there. But basically I'm saying that my main here is my container for my H1. And when that gets to 40 rem, it will change right there. Uh, you'll notice when I made that M, it actually changes the breakpoint of it. It's much wider than when it was the other one, right? If I put that back to rem, it's gonna go back to white at this size. Um, so it happens sooner with the rem than the M. And that's just because of how I've declared my font sizes within my document. This is really important. So if I come up to here and I actually say this is 32 now, like before, that's going to influence this. Now we actually have to get really wide before it's never even kicking in because we're never getting 40 rem wide enough, right? Because we're limited in the total space of our container. Uh, this is something that could be really, really powerful and impactful and uh, it completely changes how we can do things because we're not, we won't always be basing it based on the width of the container, we can be basing it on the font size or things like our CH character, right? So when it's like 20 CH wide, then we can change the color of it. And so there where it hits that 20 CH, we're making the change over or whatever it is. And this actually works, which is really cool. Now, why this is important is we're actually gonna lean into that for this next part here, uh, where I've set things up uh, quickly. I'm gonna look at just the setup very fast where I have this grid auto fit. Uh, we'll look at the CSS for it in a second. And then there I have these articles right here. One thing, if you've ever used container queries with grid or flex before, you've probably had to run into where you have to have like an extra element nested inside, right? Uh, which is a bit of a pain. And there, there's a reason why this happens. This becomes the container for the element that's there and you can't change the style of the card. You have to change the style of the stuff inside of it because the container can't style itself. Uh, with this that we're going to look at today, we don't need that, which is kind of fun. Uh, so I just have my article with the stuff. This first one here has an image in it. The other ones don't, but I'm going to treat all of these, uh, sort of <laughs> as individual articles or whatever. Um, and this is my featured one. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. Uh, just so this one's a little bit different because I want to focus on that and just to style that one differently. I have used first child that we're going to come back and I'll look at a fun, different way you can do this afterwards. Um, instead of just using a class or something like that. What I've also done here is I've set up the grid template columns with my auto fit and I'm using a min of 30 CH uh, here. So the minimum size is 30 CH. So once the card has enough room or once there's enough room for the column to have uh, you know 30 CH across, it's going to make two columns and then it goes up to three and then four and so on. And which is awesome. Uh, the other thing is I have given this a name. So it's my container with the grid auto fit is the name of it. And then the inline size is the container type there. And this name I'm actually gonna use because I think it makes sense in this context um, to, to have a container name uh, on this. So what we're gonna do is let's get in there right now and do an at container. And I only want this to affect cards because you might have cards in other places, right? And I only want these styles that I'm gonna do now to come into play if we're in a container with called grid auto fit, and we're gonna figure out what size we want different stuff to happen at. And so how do we know what size we want it to happen? How, you know, when does this jump from one to two columns? And well, that happens when there's room for two columns of 30 CH each. And so what we're gonna do first is I'm gonna use the new syntax. I'm gonna say inline size here. Uh, if you want, this could just be a width uh, or you could do the min width the same way you did uh, with our other ones, but I'm gonna say inline size is greater than, and then we can do calcs here. And I learned this from Miriam Susan, so thank you very much, Miriam, uh, for, for sharing that, because this is really cool and opens up this possibility. So if I have two columns, it's 30 CH times two. So I can just do that, 30 CH times two. And again, this wouldn't be possible with a media query because the 30 CH wouldn't be relevant to this grid itself that we're creating here, because it wouldn't be based necessarily on the font size here, but also because, you know, this grid doesn't take up all the space. It's a little bit narrower. It'd be really basically, it'd just be magic numbering your way to try and figure this out. And if ever you threw this into a different context, the whole thing would fall apart. So we can do that and this isn't perfect, but let's just do this really fast. 
And we'll just say grid column for now. Grid column is going to go up to two, uh, span two. So here we're at one column, it's fine. And then when we get to two columns in our layout, now it spans across two. Cool, right? There is a small little thing here where you might, there might be a little, actually I don't see it now, but there, there's the potential for some weird overlap there, just because we do have a gap on here of one rem. So we could add that here as well, plus one rem, just to make sure that it's happening at the exact same time uh, and now there's no potential for any issues because this is gonna be 30 CH, one rem, 30 CH. So we just add that in. Technically speaking, this could be a custom property. This could be a custom property, uh, you know, we're referencing that custom property that's in the spec, but it doesn't work right now. <laughs> you do have to just put the number of whatever your gap is here. But that's cool. Uh, and then what we could do is to make this look a little bit better, we could say this is a display grid. And then I could say it's a grid template columns of, you could do a, a repeat here of two one FR in this situation because I am using the auto fit and then it's gonna give me my two columns. The reason this is working, the reason this is cool is because I'm changing my card I, I don't need that like next container to be looking at anything in the size of stuff. This is all based on the size that's happening here that I'm changing the direct child, this one card here. So this is getting the new styles on it. Uh, the repeat to one FR will work in this situation all the time because our columns are always equal. So there's no issue with that though. You know, we could just do a subgrid here and that would work as well. And subgrid's cool. So I'm going to do it that way. Uh, I'm not really gaining anything by doing it with the subgrid. So if you'd prefer to do it without, that's completely fine. Um, but I do want to do it with subgrid here just because there's one extra thing I can highlight along the way, um, on how different things are working. And then we could even, we're come in here and we're going to say that we have our image. Uh, so I can select the direct child. I'm using nesting here. If you've never seen nesting, we're just saying an image that's the direct child of my card first child. So the direct child image nested in the original selector. I'll put a card and a link in the description to a video that goes more in depth in nesting if you'd like to learn more about it. Uh, and here we can say that it's a grid uh, row of one over one, two, I think it's four, right? That we'd want. There we go, because this is one column, that's one column, that's one column. Uh, just because each one of these is its own element, I don't have a div wrapping anything. And look at that, that's working. And the reason I wanted to use subgrid here is just to show you like the image isn't lining up uh, down the middle, it's lining up because of the gap, because subgrid will use the gap from the parent, but you can also overwrite it. So I can actually say gap is zero here and now it's gonna break right down the middle. So yeah, I think that's pretty cool. I could also come on this image here and I could say this is a grid column of two, so it pushes over. So yeah, I think that's pretty cool. And we get to there. Now we want to have it change again when we get to three columns, if you want. That actually doesn't look too bad. Maybe we leave it the same way uh, for three columns because I think that kind of is neat. And then when we get to four columns, maybe we want it to be bigger. So then we do the exact same thing that we had. We'll just copy that right there and we'll come here. So our at container, but this time when it's four columns, so we just say 30 CH times four, our column count goes right there. Uh, and in this case, if it's four columns, we're gonna have one, two, three gaps. So we're just gonna add three rem there to make sure the breakpoint is correct. And then we can just come in and change what our layout is doing. We have the subgrid, so we had the grid column span two. Maybe we just add a grid row span two uh, to make it really big. And then so when it gets to that point, we end up with this. Obviously the layout needs a little bit of fixing up in this case. So you know what, uh, that's probably not working. So let's drop this to a three and a two. And we'll come here and say this is a grid column of span one, um, just so we change the layout a little bit. So it goes to that, then it can span this way. Obviously my image styling here is gonna have to change, uh, right? So this could grid column of one, grid row of one, back to being just at the top. Uh, so we go from that layout to that layout. And then here we could probably, you know, expand it out, whatever you want. It's really fun uh, and easy to do by using our calc in here. And this is something again, that you wouldn't be able to do with a traditional media query. And what this does is really allow us to build these intrinsic uh, layouts that are based on the content and the size of the content and have things being manipulated 
based on the size of the content and the space that it has to live, there is the connection that we have to draw between different things with our auto fit in this case. But of course, there's other ways that you could use this as well. This could even be based on like viewport widths and other things too, which is weird that you'd have a container that's looking at viewport widths and other stuff, but you could definitely do that and use it in really interesting and creative ways. And I did promise that uh, there was one other thing that I wanted to look at. So here, instead of doing it as a first child, we could actually do this as has, uh, and has a direct like an image that's directly inside of it. So then if you had other cards that had images, the same type of thing would be happening where they sort of automatically become a featured card or something like that. Uh, it is potentially going to cause some issues. You might need to use a dense with your fit to make sure you don't end up with empty holes. That's always dangerous because then the tab and reading order goes out of whack a little bit. Um, but it could just be another, you know, I wanted to show that as an idea as well. And yeah, now if you'd like to learn more about the basics of container queries, comparing them to media queries, or if you'd like to know more about nesting, there's videos that you might enjoy right here. And with that, I would like to thank my enablers of awesome, Andrew, Philip, Simon, and Tim, as well as all my other patrons for their monthly support. And of course, until next time, don't forget to make your corner of the internet just a little bit more awesome.